and welcome everybody. I can't think of anything better to do on a rainy Friday than sit in on a very interesting webinar, Design Thinking in the Era of Industry 4.0. And I'm Leslie Danahy, Assistant Dean and Executive Director of the Bold Center at Douglas Residential College, Rutgers University. And the Bold Center has been providing leadership and career development opportunities for students for the past four years. And of course, we are a close campus partner to the Rutgers Center for Experiential Learning and Success. And I'm so pleased to be here today with folks from the company Amplo Global. We're here with the CEO, Anirban Bhattacharya, and the VP for Innovation, Sonia Banerjee. And this wonderful new relationship started last fall when Amplo Global became involved in our externship or job shadowing program, they have hosted a few of our students and one of the students I had had in class a few years ago. And in January, late January, she came bursting into my office telling me all about this amazing experience she was having. And I said, I really need to find out more about this company and the people behind this extraordinary experience. So here we are, actually, Anir and I in February, we're talking about doing a three-day design thinking camp. And of course, we were not able to uh, follow through on those plans, hopefully in the future, but that's how we got to this 90-minute webinar on design thinking. So I'm really grateful to have this relationship with Amplo Global and the people within that company. And thank you so much, Anir and Sonia and the students for putting the time into this. And I'll turn it over to you right now. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Our pleasure. I'm going to share my screen here. Okay, so thank you, Leslie. Uh, good afternoon. I'm assuming everybody is in the East Coast. It's already 12 noon. And um, as Leslie said, said it's the, the best thing we could do on a rainy day. So we, I would started in early 17, early 18, when we suddenly had a Eureka one day to come up with an idea where we can really focus uh, on like the tip of the spear of an organization, which is strategy before any execution happens. There's some kind of strategy an organization executes on, uh, goes through it, and then the actual implementation of the strategy happens. Any strategy like merger acquisitions, divestitures, new product introduction, opening up a new plant, uh, if it's a manufacturing company, service companies servicing their clients, they need a strategy behind that, right? So one thing uh, has been uh, very uh, common, I think not only in the last two, three years when since we started, but before that, is how this whole strategy could be design-led and uh, data-led. And of course, it was always, uh, there has been an engineering component to strategy, a structure component to strategy. Your strategy is ambiguous. There has been a structure, there has been a framework. But what uh, we have been witnessing, the strategy is moving to design. So it, it is design-led, it's uh, persona-led. We'll use these terms today quite a bit. So that's where um, our organization's uh, uh, culture is set on one of the pillars is design led. Of course, second is data led, um, third is uh, collaboration led. Um, you're pretty flat as an organization. So design is a big component, right? How do you balance your left and right brain is a big component. And when uh, I was uh, presenting, a few, I think a few weeks back in, uh, in Duke University, where we went for recruitment, um, one of the students asked a question, uh, that what exactly, what skills you look, uh, look for when you hire somebody? And I said, uh, imagination, uh, even before knowledge. So that's, a, that's something I believe in. Uh, sometimes it's very powerful, but we need uh, the knowledge to also execute that imagination. So that's the reason it's not a single person company. We have around 50 people in the organization, few customer bases where we implement the product. We have a product and we are very proud to integrate a concept called Industry 4.0. It's a fourth revolution where it's all about connected products, connected data, connected experience experience, connected strategy that connect to what is very critical. And I think Sonia will cover, I will also cover a bit. So, so Sonia uh, leads uh, our innovation. She has played a considerable role in uh, bringing design thinking process to a product. 
along with uh, with with our other champions in the organization. Uh, they're not speaking today. Hopefully, we will get introduced to them slowly in our relationship moving forward. Uh, some of them are based out of New, uh, New Jersey. Our chief design officer is based out of New Jersey. Uh, and uh, Sonia had been instrumental to take that process and work with uh, our chief design officer, Shilpa, and our CTO, Nava, to get a product out. So we have productized design thinking. I'm sure we'll cover that a bit too. So this is our um, agenda today. Leslie did a great job in introducing Rutgers and us. Thank you so much. And uh, we talked about the speakers. In the next couple of slides, I will talk about uh, in introduction of Industry 4.0. Uh, Sonia will cover extensively uh, the academic part as well as the industry application part of design thinking. And then we'll have our uh, lovely interns to cover a short case study where Sonia is leading that effort. And we'll end up with uh, what, what's in there for you from a career perspective, from a relationship between Amplo and Rutgers perspective. And we'll open up, of course, for Q&A. So as I mentioned, we have a product. Uh, so we have uh, a model, modularized way of scoring and measuring strategy of an organization. So some, if you're, you're in the undergrad and you are in, let me in business school or even, even not in business school, you will get to hear the word strategy, I'm sure. And uh, you do strategy every day when you sit before an exam what's your checklist, what's your strategy, which things you will cover first, which things you will not cover, which, which questions you can leave, but still you can have a good, good score. That's strategy, right? So, and take it to an application level in a bigger scheme of thing with clients is a strategy too. So we have five modules. The first one is we call AMP marking, which is nothing but a benchmarking of an organization where organization stands in its own maturity. Uh, maybe from digital strategy or overall corporate strategy, um, go-to-market strategy, channel strategy. Um, and then do you have the capability to enable that strategy? How do you measure it? And once you do this, three things. Uh, let's create an adoption uh, policy through design thinking and change policy with design thinking. Design thinking is not only the design part, it's also bringing the team together and have a consensus uh, for the next three to five years of, the, of all the programs that an organization would run. And then, of course, uh, road mapping the, those programs. From, a, uh, from an Industry 4.0 perspective, I will highly encourage all of you to uh, Google about this, right? So, and uh, as under, understand certain concepts, right? One example that uh, is very close to my heart is uh, servitization. Pretty new word for you, productization or consumerization. This, these are some of the words that it's very applicable to the industry where it's going. Um, of course, during the COVID-19 era, uh, nobody will do the business uh, the way they have done in the last 10, 15, 20 years. There will be a dramatic shift. Uh, when Leslie and I talked about this webinar uh, at that time, I think uh, somehow the news did not come through this side of the pond in the US, but now we all know how, what we are exposed to. So servitization is something which is a concept where you're not only selling a product like a car, but you sell services along with it. And then the car exactly knows that you should take the car to the services. And the car exactly knows that where she should or he should stop, right? So I don't know which cars are he and which cars are she, but uh, like there's, I think there are some genders of the cars here. And um, it's, uh, and how do you make sure that you exactly know that uh, you're going via, you're passing via Dunkin Donuts or Starbucks and uh, the car says, hey, Honorban, do you want to stop? You took a, you actually ordered a latte yesterday. By the way, that's happening. That's civilization, right? Customer service. But to achieve that voice recognition enablement in the car, a lot of design thinking has gone behind, like through behind it, into it, through it, right? Otherwise, it's very hard to even consumerize that, that uh, suddenly the car starts speaking uh, when, you see, when it comes to a 
close maybe a one mile or 0.8 miles to that Starbucks where you stopped yesterday, right? So in any, uh, so this is a manufacturing example. Uh, so Internet of Things is very common. So do Google about Internet of Things as well. So in manufacturing industry, uh, manufacturing uh, is getting into much more uh, new business models where they are much more design driven, robots driven, uh, cobots driven, cobots, cognitive robots, where robots even are like, uh, like much more smaller than, than humans, seems like in certain shop floors, especially in auto- automotive. So uh, do research about all this. It's something that uh, will be very applicable, especially when all of you graduate uh, from your undergrad or grad school. And um, this will be very, very, this is very hot right now. So uh, anything that you do around industry port auto, data-led, design-led, with you, engineering-led, of course, that's fundamental, uh, will be critical. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, the, what are three things on, um, on the fourth revolution, which is Industry 4.0, that we are looking for? Uh, transform your products and services. So just the example I gave on the car, that's a transformation of a product. Car is a product. Uh, transformation of the processes. So I will share an interesting example. I was walking the floor of Ford in Dearborn, Michigan. And uh, I went inside uh, the plant and there was not a single human being, all are robots. And the VP of manufacturing told me that, hey, we need seven more trucks in the next quarter. Uh, And I asked him, how? They're all robots. No, we need. So what he's meant by that is that even robots need uh, optimization. Robots needs uh, robots need vectorization. Uh, so long story short, uh, we actually vectorize the arm movements of the robots, and we saved around three seconds in each each manufacturing process, and they got to get around three or four cars more, not seven cars. That's what their KPIs, key performance indicator. But they were successfully um, able to get three more cars out of every quarter. So even robots, even an automotive, automatic plant needs transformation of operations. Of course, if they're human beings, we we need transformation of operations and experience. Experience is all about, um, so this, this person, VP of manufacturing sits in his, uh, in his office, and he exactly knows uh, how robots are operating and the, he talks to the robots, robots talk to him, that's experience. So uh, I give a few, a couple of customer examples, one on car, one on a few shop floor. I'll give one more example, right? One on, uh, so this is an engine manufacturer. Of course, uh, if you are not working for Ample Global, hopefully you, you can work for these companies in your future. Um, Cummins in Indianapolis. So when they sell an engine, they don't, they don't just sell engine. They sell uh, interoperability of the engine. They sell service orientation of the in- engine. They sell real-time capability of the engine. They sell um, augmented reality of the engine. They're all ideally products along with the engine when they're selling that to Port Authority of New York or bus terminal of New Jersey in East Brunswick, right? They, what they offer to these uh, organizations who leverage the engine to manufacture the bus or assemble the bus, the bus, bus manufacturer is somebody else. Maybe some, some other companies, Alan Bradley or somebody who is creating the buses, right? So um, they help the transport company bus authority of New Jersey or port authority of New York in 42nd street to exactly tell them that this bus will fail on Wednesday, next Wednesday, April 29th, you, you better take the bus out of the route, but also the bus actually can do a three mile route, not the seven mile route. So you can put the bus on the bus on the seven, uh, three mile route. So, but it will fail on the seven mile route though, by the way, that's where the industry is. That's another example of, uh, reality check of knowing that uh, how Cummins are selling services after even selling the engine. So there's a backbone to this, right? So somebody has simulated this in a shop floor 
in a design center in Cummins to know what the customer wants after three years. And that's what design thinking is about. So that's value, which we talked about. I give three examples, right? And um, it's all about user driven. And uh, at the end, it's, there is value. There is a value creation. Otherwise, uh, there would not be design thinking in the, in the universe. And this has been a pretty cool career for certain people. And when I was a kid in India, India is little, maybe India's population is very high and very competitive. So my, one of my cousins said uh, that uh, don't go for engineering. Uh, you should go for economics or uh, something at that time, Stanford just discovered this early 90s or maybe before that or late 90s, mid 90s. Then I, I thought, oh, how come I do that? I mean, if I'm not an engineer, then my career is gone, right? But things have totally changed. I mean, if you really make your career in design thinking, it's much more valuable than being an engineer. So with that being said, I will open up for Q&A if you have any questions. Um, Sonia, if you can see in a chat window, if there's no question, then I will hand over to you. Any, any, any question, Sonia? I, I do not see any questions till now. Uh, okay. I can get started if uh, there are no questions. Okay. Okay, okay. great. Um, uh, Andy, uh, go back to the first slide, please. No, the previous slide. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, uh, thank you, Andy, Anir, uh, for that uh, fantastic uh, uh, introduction. So uh, before we get into what design thinking really is, uh, let's step back for a moment to know how it evolved, where it evolved from. So uh, a bit of history, really. Back in 1960, uh, a, a gentleman called Horst Rittel coined a very important term called wicked problem, which is essentially a complex, complicated, multidimensional uh, problem that requires collaborative uh, thinking, collaborative methodology, often centered around human experiences. So that was really, uh, I think, the spark in uh, thinking, uh, design as a problem solving uh, tool. Going forward in uh, 70s, a uh, Nobel laureate and a cognitive scientist called Herbert Simon further elaborated design as a science or a way of thinking, really. In 90s, going forward, as uh, Anir also mentioned, Tim Brown of Ideal coined the word design thinking. Uh, and uh, it was popularized by Stanford thereon. And by the time uh, 2000 or possibly uh, beyond 2000 is when it started getting adapted. The basic framework started getting adapted to a lot more many situations by a lot more uh, uh, organizations. Having said that, let's understand really what is this design thinking going forward. So essentially, it's nonlinear and it's iterative, it's immersive, it's collaborative. And these are the essential uh, uh, you know, points of uh, design thinking. And the most important part really is its focus on human centricity. It's focus on user centricity. And this, when it comes together, together it, it creates innovation that differentiates that reimagines environment that reimagines uh, you know experiences and therefore differentiates and creates value in your user's life so in another important part over here is how design thinking works best in ambiguous situations so giving you an example we know currently with all the pandemic around us it is an ambiguous environment, not just personally speaking to us. We are doing a lot of things that we have never done before. And that's why it's new normal. Similarly, businesses are no different. Uh, they're facing similar issues. So just today I was having a chat uh, with a client where interestingly, the, you know, after having discussed uh, attributes of his businesses, the client actually said, uh, well, uh, and I paraphrase that uh, client, and he says, 
the problem is we don't know what our problem is. And that's really the state currently, you know. And this is where it warrants an innovation. It warrants design thinking. And you, now you can imagine how applicable and how relevant the skill and this process really is. But having known that, uh, the important part really is while it centers on human experiences, the ideas so generated have to be business viable and they have to be technologically feasible. Going ahead, before we get into, so I've been talking about user experience and let's look at a couple of two, three examples, not more. These are not ample use cases. I have uh, taken them uh, from online. Uh, I thought that this is uh, one of the best ways to tell you what design thinking uh, and what user experience. Yeah, design thinking will come to that later. Look at this and, and tell me that, are you not cringing like I am? I mean, it's a functional product. But what happens to, you know, whoever planned this uh, key placements, uh, I don't know what mood they were in, but that hampers user experience, wouldn't you be? I mean, getting into a lift and seeing haphazard placed uh, uh, numerics, uh, that's, that's not going to leave you with a great experience. Similarly, going ahead, a couple of more examples. Look at this keyboard. Uh, how frustrated would you be using this? The, down, up, left and right arrows are placed. Again, uh, uh, this, this totally deters uh, a user experience at that point of time and creates continuous and consistent frustration so much so that the user would rather give up than continue with uh, such a product. However, there are some good examples too. For example, Heinz. Uh, you know, when we were kids, we always saw a uh, tomato ketchup in a regular bottle. But imagine the user centricity, the insight, and most importantly, the application of insight, where they turned it upside down, because that way a user is able to experience the product better, unhindered, and brings in a delight, therefore. So that's designing for experience. Moving forward. Another great example of increasing brand memorability through packaging. Uh, and this is also an unmet uh, need that a design thinking process usually tries to fulfill. So not only are you, uh, you know, giving out two, two, two wines at a time, but you're actually uh, encouraging them to use the shelf or the packaging per se to use it as shelf and therefore increasing that brand presence on your table forever going forward and this the, I, I love this example so simple so centered on human experience so centered on users a simple spoon with a butter and that kind of solves everything you know so that that's delightful experience but to do that yes uh, i need next slide but to do that, it's very, very important to have certain, it's, it's important to have a mindset. And I couldn't be focusing more on user centricity, but design thinkers are often the ones who bring in clarity and ambiguity, such as the current situation. And why so? Because essentially they are problem solvers, they are critical thinkers, and most importantly, they have a childlike curiosity and imagination. So if you want to be a design thinker, never, ever let go of that, no matter what. But over and above that, it's very important to keep your ears to the ground. It doesn't mean that the idea that you have come up with is always uh, best suited for your users, not always. Sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, you know, the, the ideas you may have come, the, come up with actually doesn't uh, center around uh, the user. And often that means you go back to the process and you iterate. That means you're adaptive to feedback. Some of the tangibles, of course, are you've drawn out a lot of insights through empathizing. And that's, again, a focal point of design thinking. So uh, empathy is really at the core of it. So, through empathizing uh, with your stakeholders is where you start applying those user-driven insights, you know, 
and the rest are all outputs of design thinking, which we will cover in later slides. Going ahead. So what are the existing models? Like I said, we started with uh, Stanford. Uh, uh, Stanford really started this. And this is the basic framework. Remember this. You start empathizing with the users. You define what your problem is. You go out and ideate. You prototype and then you test. However, like I said, many organizations uh, thereafter adapted it. So on your top right, you have discovery, interpretation, ideation, and then I have the video of experimentation and evolution. Similarly, uh, another organization interpreted that as what if, and what is, what if, which is really a you know, empathizing bit, and then what wows, which is when you ideate to, to draw out, to reimagine uh, the 2B scenarios, and finally what works, which is your prototyping. The other uh, uh, diagram over here will actually show you how important it is to iterate, and that's really uh, the cycle as it is in reality, because uh, you find out, you discover a problem, you empathize, and there is always tooth comb for missing links. You go back, you reflect, observe, iterate, and go ahead. Let's look at what Google does. Same framework, but you start with the understanding, and then the understanding the users, they define the problem, then they diverge. They diverge when they are collaborating on ideation, because it's free thinking, and then they converge to decide and draw consensus further, uh, draw consensus on the ideas and the priorities of those ideas, and further they then prototype and validate. Similar is SAP's process. Going ahead, so what's design thinking for Industry 4.2? Now, Industry 4.2, and I am going to keep this a little con you know, concept driven, uh, given the paucity of time, maybe in uh, subsequent webinars, I'd be very happy to, uh, you know, give you use cases. But even, uh, you know, your own uh, university students, that's if I and can, will uh, take you through a preview of their, um, of their project that they're doing with us on design thinking, which will elaborate with the use case. So going forward, uh, if this is a very simplistic view of a production system with people overlaid on process, machines interacting with people that are also overlaid on that process. So what really is the key is really a confluence of people, process, and technology. And this is where we start identifying who, uh, you know, what the problem is, who are directly or indirectly impacting it, what we call impactors and impacting. Those who are impacting a problem are impactors. Those who are getting impacted by the problem are called impactees. Uh, how then you, you know, leverage and comprehend data, because remember, Industry 4.0 uh, really, really runs on one oil, and that is data. And of course, then how it interacts and how experiential that whole interaction and intersection of experience is with technology. Going forward, a very, I know, a little complicated chart, uh, but uh, just, just giving you a, a, a wide-eyed view on this. We start, like I said, with empathizing as a situation, what exists today. Okay, we, we call it framing. We call the discovery phase framing. And we keep probing. You know, that's a very essential part of Ampho's way of design thinking. Our adaptive model is, uh, it really hovers around probing, probing till you know that you have tooth combed uh, every possible link. And as we go ahead, we converge, design, prototype, learn, and then recommend going ahead. Now, this is a patentized pro uh, process, but this essentially overlays a couple of things that I will bring in. Now, uh, Andy did speak about our product, which is uh, Amplify, which is a PaaS model, a platform as a service model, where we help 
uh, measure and score uh, uh, and currently assess uh, a company's strategy, their goal setting, and give them, you know, help them with KPIs. Now, once you have this unique insight, like no one else at Antlo, we have this unique insight which we import into design thinking. Uh, the first phase of, uh, you know, discovery, uh, discovering uh, the problem, we we only we already have a unique set of insight and we further probe into it. We get into then, uh, you know, putting it on a epic life cycle of process, which is something that I spoke about process, people and technology. We further then identify who the network of influences by their degree of influence. Network of influence again is impactor and impacting between process people and machines. So it's not just people. It's how those are interacting with process and with technology. How technology is interacting with process. All of that is uh, interwoven here to look at uh, then a uh, network of uh, influence. And then we go, up, we go out, we do interviews, we do native observation and what all it might take us to understand and empathize with the user or the stakeholders. Finally, we come out with Personas, very important. These are then the outputs. Personas as is, currently as they are, the situation as is. The personas, their own journey maps, their customer journey maps, and then an aggregation of that, which is called network of experience. Now, a network of experience is unique to Amplo and is not done anywhere else. With these revealed statements, and these are very, very in-depth, uh, very precise, giving a line of vision to what the impact problems are, uh, who are impacting it, what their customer journeys are, and as a process, what the network of experience is. With that, you get into ideation. And uh, through process of ideation, uh, we then prioritize uh, those ideas uh, on a DVF framework called desirability, viability, and feasibility. I covered that in the first slide. And then we bring in certain numerics uh, to tell them what would be uh, the cost and possible returns on experience if they were to go with a certain prioritized ideas into prototyping. And after having done that, we give them a roadmap. Going ahead. I've spoken about this, but this is what uh, Network of Experience is. It's a unified experience in Industry 4.0 environment. Going ahead, Anil. What's very important that we capture is the nodes and modes. Nodes are point of interaction, a point of intersection, right? And modes are touch points. How are they interacting? How are people overlaid on process interacting with technology? How is technology overlaid on process interacting with people? Like, uh, you know, and you said uh, that example of uh, cobots, you know, imagine that VP of operation actually wanted more optimal cobots. And so there is always uh, a place for efficiency. There's always a place for improvement. There's always a place for innovation. So with this, what we aim to bring, next slide, uh, Andy, what we aim to bring uh, uh, is uh, really an empathy map, again, very, very unique to us, where we get into more than what is being probed now. We really get into details of triggers and barriers and pains and gains. And importantly, hacks and delights, because that gives a true assessment of what the situation, as far as experience is concerned today. Going ahead. So to summarize, uh, this is how our uh, you know, model looks. We start with framing, uh, with uh, the insights that have been already generated in previous module, which is that of uh, maturity assessment of uh, capability that exists with goal setting where they want to be and where they are and with this unique insight we get into framing a problem through probing and probing really in depth till we find network of influence we amplify we find the network of experience we then ideate we prioritize on dbf 
the prototype evolve and remember it's the continuous journey and the most important part is how we bring in measurability to it so it is traceable it, this product with this you can continuously monitor trace where your ideas generated where are they in prototyping stage you know and once they are put out in the market how are they doing are they really increasing your kpis or not and how therefore you go back and start tweaking the process so this is where we get into you know prioritizing efficiency minimizing cost and fuel innovation uh, can we go ahead these are the screenshots and possibly you're the first ones to be seeing it and very very glad to report that this is possibly the first in the world that uh, design thinking in such amount of depth and that too for industry 4.0 adapted is being brought to the world it is a remote way of doing the de design thinking uh, not something that has been done uh, till now so uh, from your left this is how we uh, you know uh, how we pick up epics which means how we uh, define problems how we define network of influence, next slide, and then how we summarize the problems with numerics. We go ahead, we then, uh, you know, empathize, we record all that, we capture all that. We then draw customer journey maps, and then we draw the network of experience, which we call the reveal statement. And that's how we get into ideation, prototyping, and there on. The next slide is that of the roadmap that we finally deliver, which is measurable, which is traceable, which anyone can go back to at any time. I think that's my time for now. Thank you so much. Uh, questions? Thank you, Sonia. We actually do have a question or two in the chat. Would you like me to pose it now? Yes, that would be great, Leslie. Great. I, I, we have a student, and, and I think after she asked it a while ago, and you may have started to finish, but it might be worth reiterating. She is a food science student, oh. and um, she has, is familiar with design thinking because she actually was introduced to it in a past internship. Uh, and she loves this con concept of empathy driven and innovation. However, Beautiful. just playing the devil's advocate, you know, she says, how do we address how people may believe that in Industry 4.0, with it involving a lot of automation and the perceived removal of human factor, the depersonalization, you know, how, how do you basically uh, address this with people who feel it's not going to be as important? A valid feel is what I would say. That's what people think automation equals elimination of humans. Oh, that's not going to be so. We are 7 billion of us in this world. Who will eliminate us? Not possible. <laughs> you know, but going forward, but it's a valid question and let me try and attempt and address it. It's yeah. only through design thinking that one would know where the flaws lie today. So if you go ahead and automate, what happens to those uh, workers who are currently there? It often calls for actually upskilling because that human cognition can be used better in other processes and certain ones which don't require everyday human intervention gets automated it's only how this is a process of evolution and this is where design thinking really helps to innovate and find out which might be or what might be those processes or those intersection points which can be automated which can then free up uh, human time to make better use of a human cognition to achieve better efficiencies. Thank you. That answers that. Okay. Any other question? There's one more. Uh, a student is curious about, um, for any of you, what has been your most memorable product transformation that you ever participated in? I can. Uh, yeah, yeah, Andy, go ahead. I can get started and never stop. So I'll, I'll ask Andy to uh, go ahead and possibly answer that. Okay, I mean, feel free to uh, share your experience to Sonia. Uh, I will share one where um, it's a, it's a automotive uh, bike company in Wisconsin. So now you know everything. 
and I think you know the name of the company. <laughs> Uh, so they got a call from a dealer, uh, said that there is a, and when you drive a bike, you have to be passionate. You have to be cultic in mind to drive that bike. Right. So they said that, um, when I'm pressing a button, it is not, the bike is not moving, uh, is not speeding up from 10, 15 miles to 50 miles in three seconds. I'm just saying three seconds, but it's 10 seconds, right? So, and there's a section of people, they belong, they, from the group is, is from Duluth, uh, Minnesota. Duluth, Minnesota, if I'm not wrong. Duluth is in Minnesota. So uh, we, we, we were called in to design led this and uh, the VP of design, customer experience rather, asked me, Hey, uh, uh, Anurban, uh, what do you think about this? That uh, you press and press a button and it should go from 15 miles to 50 miles in like n number of seconds. Otherwise, they're not they don't get to feel that they're driving a bike. So the outcome of that discussion was um, we made it uh, an attribute which is seasonal. So if we enable that in December, January, February, uh, the bike will skid, right? So, so how to make an experience seasonal? Uh, so we, what we did is we did a concept called, please Google if you're not aware of this, um, it's called uh, twinning, T-W-I-N, twin, twinning. So twinning of a process and a product and an experience which will, which will be launched after two years or one year or six months. And if you have seen the movie uh, Minority Report, I think Tom Cruise, uh, it's a Tom Cruise movie, do see that. I think it came, I think 10 years back or 11 years back. So it's, it can predict where it will be the next event would happen, right? So it's a very similar concept called uh, digital twinning, process twinning. I think that's one of my best experience so far. That uh, when, the, when these uh, consumers came back and said they kind of, they're very rebellious about it, it doesn't have speed, they won't go to the competition, but still safety was important. Still uh, uh, human lives are important, right? Uh, if we know the enemy, which are uh, which is not invisible, I know you can, you can know you can understand whom we're talking about. It's COVID nineteen. It's invisible, right? But this is this problem is not invisible. That if somebody skids, uh, somebody they, he will he or she will die. So I think that uh, balancing of the passion from a consumer to make the top line up, right, which is your revenue and sales. And also keeping safety in mind, I think twinning that for a future process was an unbelievable experience for a product. It's a product, right? Bike is a product to launch. So hopefully, I mean, I have many examples, but I thought I would share this. Any, any other question? That's it for now. Thank you. Okay. okay. Yeah, uh, Leslie, I did think, uh, I think that there was just one question which I very quickly answer. Uh, it says, are there any, and this is by Anisha Khan, um, are there any open resources to learn design thinking or are there resources Ample Global has for people to access? Absolutely. Yes, Nisha. Uh, Google will give you everything, but uh, Ample specific um, resources do visit our, slide, uh, our, our website, uh, Ample Global. Just type Ample Global in search bar, it will take you to our site. And you would get a couple of our white papers uh, and blogs, et cetera, on Industry 4.0 and design thinking. And, and you, you always can reach us to us uh, via Leslie. I will share our contacts at the end if you want to make your feet wet. Uh, we do externship programs. We will do summer internship. Uh, so I think that would be a great exposure for all of you. So, yeah. Okay, so uh, our next uh, uh, speakers uh, are from uh, from your program. So I would like to introduce Sifa Akhar to take us through one of the examples that they're working with us. 
uh, in an externship program. And I think they did a fabulous job. Um, so I'd love to um, hand over to Sifa. Hello, um, we are the experts for Ample Global who worked on the design thinking, um, helped work on the design thinking webinar. I am Khan. And I'm Sifa. Um, okay, we will be taking a look at Industry 4.0, also known as the Fourth Industrial Revolution, and its relation to the fashion industry using the design thinking process. Industry 4.0 is driven by autonomous technologies such as nanotechnology, AI, and quantum computing. We will be using Industry 4.0 to look at innovations using sustainability on fast fashion. Next slide. During this externship, we determined three important frameworks to our problem statement. First, we looked into how the fashion industry is using smart factories and digital twinning to collect real-time data for instantaneous connection to the industry's network and fashion network. Then we moved on to the disruptive impact of fast fashion and the new opportunities that arose from it. We went through weeks of iterative problem solving and research to empathize with the customer about environmental, um, environmental costs. Looking at Forever 21, we observed the application of Industry 4.0, or the lack thereof. They had a weak internet presence and had other issues such as inefficiency, which ultimately led to their bankruptcy. On the other hand, fast fashion brands like H&M were able to succeed by incorporating sustainability into their business models. Also observing luxury brands, we discovered three overarching problems that pertains to the entire fashion industry. And this leads to the social cost as the first discovery stage, where we empathize with the end consumer to understand their perspectives on the defects of fast fashion. Um, it isn't made to last and ultimately ends up in landfills. However, people care about the brand image and production of fast fashion brands uh, when shaping the social identity. Uh, and this social identity concerns the sourcing of materials, the number of unsold clothes, and waste from production. And by following the end consumer concerns, we're able to narrow down our research. And that brings us to our next stage, customer concerns. Uh, there is a high volume of waste that comes from the fashion industry, and influencers began promoting resale, thrifting, hand-me-downs, and athleisure wear to minimize that. Uh, but there is a shift in behaviors as consumers are more aware of environmental damage. And this closet of the future diagram shows the trends of how recycled and off-cycled clothing is going to get bigger. On the other hand, ownership of mid-price and department is going to reduce um, and fast fashion is projected to have just a slight increase. And this helps prove our theory that consumers are more ready for sustainable fashion. However, currently fast fashion is not ready to legalize these trends. And having looked at H&M's business value chain, uh, the waste that goes into landfills are being ignored. And this includes that the problem primarily lies in the sustainable business value chain. That is an issue as 78% of millennials and 59% of baby boomers favored products marketed as ethical, sustainable, and environmentally safe. And despite demand, end consumers are unable to shop for fast fashion that are cheap, sustainable, and of good quality. Um, there are restrictions put into place on processes such as making bamboo into yarn and fabric uh, by the FTC. Other materials such as hemp are costly and they crease a lot. Not that many people know what happens to their clothes after they donate to Goodwill. And this is where the secondhand market comes into play. They sell the unsold items that, and they are shipped around the world. And this contributes to 20% of upcycling and downcycling. Upcycling and downcycling are processes that reuses the clothing that are no longer wanted. And upcycling, um, can you can use the clothes that you already own to create or fix up clothing. Downcycling is the process of breaking down materials to make new textiles. However, only a 1% uh, end up as upcycled and only 70% for downcycling. To represent how much waste there is, there is enough to fill 1.5 Empire State Buildings every day. The landfills that come out of fast fashion waste affects the daily lives of over 64 million people. For example, pollution that comes out of the textile industry gets so bad that the citizens are able to predict the colors um, for next season's trends just by looking at their lakes and rivers. You can also find people with lung cancer visiting hospitals every week. 
This diagram displays the production and purchase of clothing to how it is used before it goes into landfills. A closed loop fashion supply chain is unable to occur without certain machines, such as separation fibers. However, we have yet to incorporate non-conducive tech to the sustainable value chain at a global scale. The discovery stages um, that the uh, the discovery stages detail the three overarching problems: social costs, customer environmental costs, and sustainability. We narrowed down the problem statement through the use of the design thinking processes. By using this roadmap and looking at the impact problem areas, we determined the degree of empathy needed to redirect our focus in the research and problem statement development. As we go through each problem area, we define the people, machine, and processes that are impacting the problem and those who are being impacted. In context to Industry 4.0, the impactor and impactee could be an intersection of people, processes, and machines. The next few slides will outline the network of influence. By mapping the current process, we can see where clothing from the fast fashion industry leads to landfills. We overlaid the stakeholders of each process to help build areas of empathy and degree of influence. The supply chain key stakeholders are the farmers and workers of the factories in the raw material harvesting stage. We derived the supply chain process from our H&M research. However, it is important to note that it is not a closed loop process as production waste is still being sent to land landfills. The end consumer journey key stakeholders are the influencers, media, and communities around landfills. The second hand market key stakeholders are workers in the wholesale and citizens of the world in the downcycling process. The closed loop journey is the only no waste circular design process as the product is being recycled back into the same product. The stages of production of renewable and sustainable fibers, uh, efficient fiber uh, fabric production, and on demand distribution resold un, uh, reduced unsold items that could potentially end up in landfills. And the recycling of textiles uses sustainable separation technologies that enter back into the processes. The key stakeholders are the designs, designers, sustainable separation fibers, um, and the production of clothing. The retail process key stakeholders are the workers at the storefront, distributors, and consumers. And so we will use our problem statement to move onto the empathy process of design thinking. We will conduct interviews, then use the points of delights and frustrations for persona building and customer journey mapping before getting to the stage of ideation. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Sifa Khan. Thank you so much. So uh, before we uh, talk about uh, a couple of uh, closing topics, uh, should we pick up some questions uh, after this, uh, be before we get to the next? Uh, Leslie? Let's so. see if any students have any questions for the students that just presented. I don't see any yet in the couple people said, not great job, fantastic to our students but no active questions at this time okay very good uh thank you so much uh thank you uh sefa thank you khan so when we um, think about uh part partnering with a prestigious uh, university like rutgers and various uh, course and curriculum of rutgers um we we do feel that uh and again, I mean, we also have to improve and we are also learning every day. It's a continuous learning that we could bring an application based or use case based uh, coursework in the middle of the trimester or semesters. Right. So that's something that we are very interested. Second is, of course, externship. Uh, please uh, either via uh, Leslie or we are in touch with her. And if you have to directly write to us. We will share our contacts as well. Do, um, we, we do encourage for externships. I think this is something uh, which we loved how the Career Center has thought through to give, uh, to enable you a so-called 40 hours of experience, but it's more than 40 hours, right? So we are very flexible in that way that you don't need to stick in a week to complete this, stay with us, experience with us. And that also, we also learn from you. Right. So uh, and then, uh, of course, there's a long term, uh, mid to long term career path with Ampler Global uh, as we grow and grow, we'll, we'll all grow together. 
So now, uh, they're, they're, yeah. they're asking, do they have to be of any specific major to get involved? Uh, no, no. Uh, I mean, we encourage to uh, be in any, any major. Um, so it doesn't need to be specifically in one major, uh, that, in one particular major that you, you can apply. No, it's nothing like that. Because I think you, you, we will all quickly know that um, would you, what kind of roles you will play in a design thinking um, program. Either you can be a design thinking facilitator or a champion who would bring the team together of a client, of a customer, or you would be a, like, a, like coordinating the core design thinking modules where you need that understanding of design thinking. Or you would be really creating the the fundamentals for the for the project. So various types of uh, brain wiring um, wirings are needed to accomplish design thinking. You just don't need to be have that creative skills. You can do you can have any skills, and if you want to make your feet wet to see how you can add value to this concept, uh, which is a real reality for almost all the all the industry, all the industry sectors now. Yeah, that's no, no. I, I believe. Uh, I mean that any everyone, if he or she wants to get into it, understand everybody will enjoy this. So, a, any other question? Not right now. Okay, I'm going to quickly cover some of the value propositions for your takeaways too. Some value proposition will maybe hundred percent will make sense. Some will not. Some will be half abs. So just make sure that you also understand and understand the outside and perspective of this, right? So, so uh, when we say DT is design thinking process, uh, so benchmarking process uh, heat map, these are common terms we use in strategy uh, programs. Uh, very important to integrate these in design thinking and I have an iterative process as Sonia has mentioned. It also works as a knowledge management repository, right? So generally, we uh, our product integrates with downstream products, uh, various other products who are like, let's say, a process mining product or an ERP product. Uh, ERP is enterprise resource planning. So it also works that in 2024, you go back and you want to see that which innovation you shelved and your bosses shouting at you that, hey, why, why this is not done? This was discussed in 2021. Uh, then you can always come back and leverage uh, Amplify 4.0 because it's also a knowledge repository pro, uh, tool. Um, of course, empathy is a big thing. Uh, traceability is a big thing. Uh, automated exception management. I think there was a question that in this digital era, uh, how could design thinking really make a mark? So one thing is uh, very important to understand, and we stay with the trends, how the innovation and uh, uh, our infrastructure innovation research and going to market and then, then finally picking up by an organization to embrace the market demand. We are moving into exception-based management. So it's an 80-20 rule. That's fundamental, has never changed. But I don't think a VP of uh, customer experience or a VP of engineering or a VP of product product development or VP of product strategy, the VP of manufacturing, a VP of logistics would be, or anyone, senior director, CEO, anybody would be focusing on the run the business. Run the business is stabilizing a lot where you would be focusing on how can, how can you make a mark to take your organization to a next level, right? So the run the business is stabilizing a lot stabilizing a lot. You would not see a dramatic shift in the run the business, but where uh, you will make a mark and you'll go to the top right quadrant is uh, change the business and transform the business. That's, that's, that's most important. So that's the reason uh, that exception-based management is very critical where automation is coming into play and run the business wing and design is coming in, change the business and transform business wing. So there's a subtlety in where the focus is going and how the cost of organizations are also going. So we, we do version the solution, as I mentioned, as a second point. 
uh, process decomposition is a heavy component to understand. What's a process decomposition means? Uh, that was not today's agenda, but I just mentioned that. Um, uh, skills and training. I think Sonia mentioned that in, in one of the questions that she answered is, uh, reskilling is a big theme now, especially in the COVID-19 era when all the six workers no more can stand around the work cell or maybe a quality badging at, an, um, at a pharma company. So what they're doing from a work retrenchment perspective is, so out of those six workers, now two workers can come on Tuesday, the other two workers will come on Wednesday, and the other two workers will come on, t on Thursday, and then again, the first two workers who came on Tuesday will come on Friday. So how do you reskill yourself to do all the three jobs without pushing, uh, pushing out your customer demand due date? Because now you have to be six feet apart, right? So even <laughs> anywhere you go, from a consumer experience of a restaurant to a business experience, so we call B2B, business to business, B2B to C, business to business to consumer. So uh, uh, lesson learned is a closed loop. Uh, constant monitoring and alerting. So it's, a, it's something that business would love to do. That, okay, if anything that's coming up uh, as a change, is the change right? Should we implement the change? And how do you manage your innovation? And zero data loss. That's very, very important that when you document your design thinking process, it's a data, zero data loss. Um, automated personal identification. So one of the things that design thinking is trying to do is once that requirement comes in, is that requirement would be funnel under an existing persona versus a new persona. That's something um, is, is important to realize without spending a money, money from, from the design thinking team's pocket. And genealogy, how you can track back, trace back, track forward, trace forward your, your, your solution, right? A track and trace is extremely important maybe from an inventory of uh, supply chain to uh, new product introduction, uh, to services, uh, to sales, everything. So that being said, uh, I think uh, that's pretty much we had. Uh, love to open up the last round of Q&A. Uh, I am not bringing the Q&A up here. Uh, I'm in there. Honor. The one of the students are asking, is there an internship application out right now for Amplo? Uh, not yet, uh, not yet. Uh, we are trying to fight uh, with the invisible uh, enemy right now. Uh, we should be able to bring it up. We'll work with Leslie by May 15th. Uh, there are a few uh, things we would do in summer uh, for your experience. Uh, one is definitely design thinking and helping us to improve our own product, for example, Fly 4.0. Uh, and uh, the second thing we will also do design led uh, social responsibilities. So I'm working with somebody in India uh, who champions uh, social responsibility programs. So both of them would be very intriguing for you. Um, so do apply uh, and we will, we will work with Leslie. Not yet. Long answer here, but not yet. We, we, are, we wanted to publish that by my April 30th, but now we are thinking uh, when we should do that. So, so that's... Thank you. No, that's great. That's great. And I'm happy to see one of my former students from the course I teach, Nika. She's asking, um, you know, first of all, saying that this summer she will be a supply chain consultant. So this material ties directly to her work, which she's excited about. One question she has is, once you have a new proposed solution, how do you weigh its potential benefits to the cost of transitioning from the previously held practices, which everyone is already accustomed to? Fantastic question. Uh, and the answer to that question is you always have to do a baseline as is to a baseline to be analysis. So if you dig into, uh, and we can, I would love to have a session with you, and some of our champions in the organization, uh, is how do you actually do a capability analysis before you commit for a change or uh, how do you make sure that if a change is completely a blue ocean blue ocean you can google about that or the change is red ocean right blue ocean is something a new business model red ocean is something which is under the existing business you want to improve 
right? In either cases, oh, our module two, which is a capability modeling, we do a baseline as is versus baseline to be. Uh, we capture pain points. We capture, we represent those pain points back into ideations in module four. And we score those pain points and we score those opportunities. And we tell them that, listen, at the end of the day, uh, this is your as is score where you stand. Uh, you could go from this A fly score to this score, uh, assuming the criteria of as is scoring and to be scoring are same. Uh, we would say that, you know what, you should actually implement this. So we are continuously helping uh, uh, an, an organization with a left brain analysis of capability modeling and a right brain analysis of design thinking. Left, right, yeah, my arms are right. <laughs> so, um, so uh, and we, how we uh, mishmash it so that, uh, I'll, I'll, and, and I get passionate about this topic. Uh, we should talk about this because my background is in supply chain. Uh, so uh, now you have no other option to, but to have a second <laughs> with us. Is um, something that, um, how do you make a, a very, uh, very logical function, something that look obvious to you to launch, suddenly your CEO says, no, I'm not going to launch it. Then you get passionate, you, you go to his or her office and say, hey, why we would not launch this? Then he or she comes up with a right brain analysis saying, hey, listen, if you do this, we will be cannibalizing the product which we haven't thought about. Continuous weighing in that uh, new, new normal versus normal. So hopefully I'm answering your question here, but there is a, there's a capability modeling analysis continuously we have to do. Uh, amp marking we call benchmarking we have to do we have to always see targets versus actuals and make sure that the that launch you challenge and your role would be uh, in in the new in the organization to challenge the normal and take them to new normal like especially you'll get into an area where there'll be a very short term focus in certain organizations um, and uh, you need to you need to make sure that you continuously weigh in and have a, those numbers generally don't lie if the number of calculations and algorithms are right, right? So your numbers will speak for your management. That's great, thank you, Anur. And Peter is asking, <clears throat> do you think every business going forward post COVID-19 will have to discover its new normal? Uh, some organizations are ahead. So I have been extremely lucky to work with uh, uh, a heavy equipment manufacturer in uh, Peoria, Illinois. You can search um, uh, Peoria, Illinois, heavy manufacturing. Um, the name of the organization is, of course, I can share this, uh, Caterpillar. Um, I was chatting with one of their leaders a few weeks back about this whole COVID-19 thing, and they said, Listen, um, we don't have to do everything, uh, but we will shuffle our priorities. But we don't have to rediscover us. We know how 2025 looks for us right now, right? Mid-market to small, they have to because uh, their survival, their revival, revival and be they being a thriver, so survival, revival, and being a thriver is, 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 is based on the value chain. Because organizations like Caterpillar or GE or Cisco, uh, these organizations have figured out uh, with a good balance sheet. They've figured it out, right? That, okay, if a natural calamity happens or an event happens, how my event-driven supply chain would look like. They will quickly have a control tower, control room to figure that out. But what would be the most important to run a business is um, for the mid-markets. I think mid-markets will be completely revamping in the next six months. Their sourcing strategy, their data strategy, their uh, which uh, international business they will be uh, getting into. Um, that's the market would be a big focus. And you will see a lot of um, organizations or consultative organizations or firms or even organizations like us 
we would focus on mid market because large markets anyhow they are advising our leaders and senators in the washington dc right now as we speak right uh, but um, i think the mid market will be completely reviving their strategy okay thank you another question here with the rise of data science and analytics and their ability to allow businesses to predict what will happen in the market do you think this can potentially negatively affect users role in design thinking so um, great question again i have an example again right so uh, a few few weeks back uh, there is an uh, there is an article i think in uh, cpg inside which is consumer packaged goods inside or um, i think in or hbr some, somewhere so Kraft Heinz went back to its uh, retailers and distributors and said that uh, we have a team based out from based out of I think East Europe or Europe, who is um, who is who is uh, sharing uh, KPIs with us with the headquarters, and in the COVID nineteen era or as we go move forward, uh, we will not ship any more ketchup if you don't follow these KPIs. So suddenly the retailers got excited about it. Concerned is the right word about it. Hey, we, will, we may not meet the de uh, demand spike that will come in June or July when the market reopens, right? Or just a demand spike we had a few weeks back, right? And the aisles were empty. What uh, organizations are saying that we need to design think to drive an analytics program now, because I'm not gonna buy everything from, I mean, it's, they make ketchup, right? They make uh, tomato ketchup and maybe other food products. They're selling KPIs as a service. I have to follow this KPI to ask for how many ketchup cases I need for the June and July. They said, yes. So that's an analytics program they have run. It's called KPI as a service. But then that analytics program is backed up by a lot of design that they have they, they thought through how planogram will look like. Google about planogram. Planogram is nothing but and how an aisle will look like in June and how an aisle look like in July and how an aisle look like in September. Kraft Heinz has already designed thinking before they launch this KPI program with their distributors. So even what the answer is that even a analysis program or analytical program, a consumer behavior program, is backed up by personas because there are various personas who will run and run for ketchup, right? So if my sugar is high, I would run, I would not run for a ketchup. If my A1C is high, I would avoid a ketchup. I would not go to the aisle. So where I would go, I would mainly go for an organic uh, product, which may be good for my sugar. It may reduce my sugar, right? So I have, a, I have two use, use bases right now. One is diabetic users and one is non-diabetic users. So these per two personas, I will figure out how my plan planogram will look like before I publish an analytics in the market saying, hey, I need to save my own inventory because my retailers and distributors are not paying me right now. I'm talking about ketchup uh, program here. But when I run the program of KPIs and analysis and my 100 analytical uh, champions are cranking out analytics for me, I need to respond, I, I need to respond by personas. What is persona as a design, design led? I think there is no dearth of design-led work in Industry 4.0 KPI as a service uh, environment. There's no dearth. I mean, it's, it's all design-led. That's the reason it's called mm -hmm. connected. So connected doesn't mean that a human empathy is going away. Connected means that how can I make humans more successful so that we can all have a Walmart store in Mars in 2030, right? Mars is a yeah. So yeah, so that's what, uh, and it's a long answer, but think in that direction where an analytical program is not about a persona. Who is consuming it is something that you have to think. Okay, thank you. This might be our last question, but this student is an environmental engineering and public health major, and uh, they, they love the models. They find them, your, your models are particularly interesting as I have to use it to find all the possibilities in terms of public health and climate change. This type of thinking is especially pertinent in terms of disaster relief, especially when other things like COVID-19 is happening. As we know, hurricane season is coming in June. 
So the question is, how would you use design thinking in terms of juggling multiple problems occurring at once? Fantastic question. And uh, I will give a shot and if Sonia can chime in, that would be great. Uh, so we talked about problem pinning. Let's start bottoms up here, right? So we can take a concept called EPIC. EPIC is multiple problems under that EPIC, right? EPIC as a word EPIC which has multiple problems. And then you categorize the plot problems, you empathize the problems. So let's take an example again, right? We are working with a CPG company. They make uh, athlete bars. So you really see um, the Food Safety Modernization Act that the government has released. Uh, they call FISMA, where innovation and technology will play a role so that when you buy a particular athlete bar, you don't fall sick because there is a good amount of, the biases are removed from your allergen and patho, pathogenic um, analysis. But if you really see in the, in the floor, I walk the floor personally, what organizations do, they have 15 lots, maybe third lot, seven lot, and the 15 lot, they will pull it out and say, hey, there is no allergen issues out here, pass. What about the fourth and fifth lot? By the way, that's how industry operates. The believe in that, if in my statistical data model, right, if I have third lot, seventh lot, and the 15th lot, is um, we don't have any food, food safety issue, that means all the 15 buckets which will go to Walmart, they're fantastic for the retailers to buy. Is that always true? Of course not. So how do you do? That's one problem. The, they, how they pin this problem is they check three or four other things. They see the manufacturing line. They see the badging and the quality analysis of that line. And then they see the sanitization line. And then they come and do the allergen analysis. Four problem statements. When they're doing it, their output is one consolidated that, yes, this lot is great to go. Right? So how they do that? These four problems under one big epic, Food Safety Modernization Act, meeting the FDA compliance issue, checkbox. So that's also when we do design thinking, these three or four things, manufacturing line, quality line, patho pathogen analysis, um, the FISMA reporting, all are various problems. And you take the, and, and all the problems into one epic called Food Safety Modernization, and then you go after um, with your good records and good manufacturing practice, as we call it, GXP, uh, good X practice, good compliance, good manufacturing, good packaging practice, or GXP in, in this example. So yeah, I mean, in, when you do climate uh, sustainability programs like this, um, this is extremely crucial that you don't only consider one problem because one problem doesn't remove the bias, though, in the last 4,200 years, people think that, oh, I have done my lot control analysis. But that's not lot control analysis. That's, that's a sampling analysis. So I will, that, that's my answer. That's great, Honor. I, I gave them my email address. So if any other students have questions, they can certainly get them to me and I could forward them to you. But I want to thank the panel. This has been an outstanding presentation. Honor Bond, Sonia, Khan, and Sifa. Thank you so very much. And I look forward to staying in touch with you over the next couple of months and into the future. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. It's been a pleasure, too. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Be safe. Bye-bye.